My name is Marina Richardson, uh, Clinical Research Manager at CADIC, uh, and Helen and I have been working quite a bit in the biosimilars biologics area, so um, we're here to present to you today. Um, so just a reminder, questions can be emailed to events at cadis.ca. And with that, I think we can get started. So today, um, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we're going to go through um, an intro to biologics and biosimilars, so to talk about what they are um, and give some examples of them. Then we'll jump into regulatory considerations for biosimilars. And we're actually going to spend quite a bit of time on this part because I think it's quite important to understand the rigor of the review from Health Canada um, as we move along the, the uh, um, reimbursement continuum. Um, so that foundation knowledge about how Health Canada conducts their review is quite important and quite helpful um, when it comes to questions that may come up from patients. Uh, following that, we'll then jump into public reimbursement pathway for biosimilars. So that's where uh, CADIS comes in with our health technology assessment uh, review of biosimilars and then um, following on with uh, reimbursement at the drug plan level. Then we'll get into some questions specifically that we thought would be helpful or be top of mind for yourselves as practitioners, um, which may come up from patients. Um, so I'll use some of these five questions that I've outlined here uh, to get at some key concepts that I think are important for you to uh, have in mind. And then we'll close with some recent developments and um, anticipation of what is to come in this space. So starting off with some definitions, and these are actually uh, verbatim from Health Canada's guidance. So I'm actually going to read them out um, to you just so you can, again, keep in mind what they are and how biosimilars uh, fit in. So biologics, as defined by Health Canada, are biologic drugs that are derived through the metabolic activity of living organisms and tend to be significantly more variable and structurally complex than chemically synthesized drugs. So I've included some examples here, such as hormones, growth factors, antibodies, cytokines, vaccines, and enzymes. Um, but compared to other drugs, they tend to be more expensive. They uh, tend to be authorized um, for use across multiple indications. Uh, you'll see some of the examples. Some of them are specific to, for example, rheumatological conditions for Enbrel. Um, Remicade may consist of rheumatological conditions and inflammatory bowel disease. And then there's actually um, products, Humira, it's um, for rheumatological, IBD, and oncology conditions. So it's interesting because not all drugs have these multiple indications, whereas most biologics that we see have the multiple indications. And as well, we see different side effects with biologics. So immunogenicity is, is a concern because um, the body does respond to these drugs, their biologics differently than just drugs because the immune system recognizes um, um, the, the product. And then also just to note that um, based on some Canadian statistics, we do see that, that five of the top 10 pharmaceutical products sold in Canada um, based on 2015 sales are biologics. And you see them listed there. So they are quite costly to the healthcare system. And then if, if we look at biosimilars, um, I, again, this is a definition from Health Canada guidance document. And it's just important to really look at uh, this definition. So again, I'm going to read it out. Um, so a biologic drug, a, a biosimilar is a biologic drug that enters the market subsequent to a version previously authorized in Canada and with demonstrated similarity to a reference biologic drug. So a biosimilar relies in part on prior information regarding safety and efficacy that is deemed relevant due to the demonstration of similarity to the reference biologic drug and therefore influences 
the amount and type of original data required. So I'll get into more detail on, on um, future slides, but but that's that's important to keep in mind is that um, the biosimilar is subsequent to a previously authorized drug. So the data and the data requirements are different than a regular drug. So some key points here that I've also highlighted is that um, for a biosimilar, it does not mean that there is a death Declaration of pharmaceutical equivalents, bioequivalents, or therapeutic equivalents. And also that they are not considered generic products, but they are subsequent versions. And these have come out similar to gen uh, generic due to patent expiry. Uh, some other terminology that you may have come across um, in Canada, these were uh, these were previously known as subsequent entry biologics, and you may see them referred to in the literature as follow-on biologics. But standard in Canada now is that, that they're called biosimilars. So these are just getting into some uh, examples of potential biosimilars that we can expect to see or potentially see in Canada. So these are ones for cancer indications. So um, uh, bevacizumab um, and others there, they have patents that are expire um, in 2018 and 2019. And so these, these are just examples of some of many that are expected. And also just to note that um, the EMA, the EMA um, so the Europe, European Regulatory Agency and the FDA, so the US um, uh, regulatory agency, they have actually already approved uh, some of these agents. So that's just differences based on patent expiry in the different uh, countries. And then similarly for non-cancer indications, um, we can see that some patents that are expiring between um, 2017 to 2019, we have um, uh, other biosimilars in this space with, again, as you can see, multiple indications. Um, so just also noted there too that even though there is um, one reference biologic drug, we're also seeing uh, multiple biosimilars that are coming in to the same reference product. Uh, so for example, from a CADIS standpoint, we've received um, submissions to review biosimilars for Atenercept, and so far that have gone through the process to uh, Atenercept biosimilars have come through. Similarly for infliximab, we are currently um, undergoing a review of the second infliximab that has come through the CADIS process. So, um, now jumping into again the, the regulatory considerations. So I said at the start that I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on the regulatory considerations because it is important to have, uh, have um, this knowledge. So regulatory approval biosimilars, they go through the same pathway, a new drug submission pathway as all other drugs do. Um, so all biologics go through this pathway and all biosimilars go through this pathway. So they all require the same um, types of data. So the quality data, the non-clinical, and the clinical data. But what is different is that um, the type of data that's required and the extent of that original data for the biosimilar is different. So I've highlighted uh, three key principles that I think you can keep in mind as you consider regulatory approval of these drugs. So beyond them going through the Regulatory Health Canada um, pathway, uh, there's also, it, it, the approach that Health Canada takes is a stepwise process. So you'll see I've, I've done sort of a ladder of the structural, functional, functional non-clinical and clinical data that's required. So this is on the basis of whatever residual uncertainty that is left at each step in that process determines how much is required at the, at the subsequent step. So um, if there is 
sufficient evidence at that structural and functional level, so that's considered the quality level data, that is grounds for um, the requirement of a reduced data package at the non-clinical and clinical level. Uh, so you'll see that becomes important when you look at biosimilars that have indications for not just one indication, they have multiple, up to five, seven indications, but that you see the clinical data that is available may only be in one group of patients. So it may only be in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And that is because um, sufficient um, evidence was available at that structural and functional level to allow um, only one clinical trial to be needed. Also, another key principle is that um, it's a different type of, of uh, studies than we're used to for regular submissions. So it's um, extensive comparability studies, and the aim is to establish that similarity. Whereas if you have a, uh, a biologic or another drug that comes through, it's looking at that at, this, at the quality level on that um, individual product itself. But because this is a subsequent version, you're looking at how this biosimilar compares to the reference biologic drug. And then when you get to the clinical stage, the aim really is to rule out any clinically meaningful differences between the two products. And that's, again, where that totality of the evidence approach comes in, because if you see that there's only one clinical trial available for this biosimilar. You need to keep in mind that at the quality data level, looking at the structural and functional characteristics of the biosimilar and the comparability between the biosimilar and the reference product, that all comes together to complete the package of the evidence that is available for the biosimilar. So um, the next couple slides are going to get at just some visuals for uh, these key kind of principles that I've just outlined. Um, I'm a visual person. I know Helen is too. So we thought it'd be useful just to um, show these in, in show these concepts in different ways. So if you see this slide on on the left hand side, it's um, looking at the data requirements for a new drug submission for a regular drug. On the right side, we're looking at the requirements for a biosimilar. And you see that the colors there represent the different types of data requirements, so that being the quality, the non-clinical, and clinical data. So overall, we have similar data requirements, but where this data is coming from varies, and the amount of data, data needed for each of those components varies. So as I, as I alluded to on the previous slide, slide for a biosimilar, the weight of that evidence on biosimilars is in the quality data submission requirements. So that includes the chemistry, the manufacturing, and those comparative um, studies that I alluded to as well, so between the biosimilar and the reference product. As well, if we think about the totality of evidence approach to approving biosimilars, uh, we also see that the shaded Shaded green and red um, parts on the right side related to the biosimilar, that is data that is coming from the reference product. Because if you think about how um, these are subsequent versions, there's data available and um, experience with the use of the reference pro product for over 10 years because typical uh, patent is for 20 years. So you have all of that time and experience um, with having patients on the drug to really understand any sort of safety concerns that may be coming up for the reference product. And so, they, again, this is another figure to illustrate this concept. Um, so you see the orange uh, part of that uh, triangle showing the biosimilar development program and the blue representing the, um, the new, a new biologic development program, and then seeing just how much data is required at each of the phases of, um, 
of receiving marketing authorization. So for a biosimilar, the weight again is in that um, pre-clinical phase, so the quality data uh, as well as the non-clinical data, and then less is required for the clinical phase because of that totality of evidence and um, the, the demonstration of similarity at that uh, earlier stage. So hopefully those two figures and just the text and thinking about it um, helps solidify that, that concept for you. And then again, just talking about the specific requirements and how that influences requirements at next stages. So as I said, quality data requirements are there, demonstrating similarity to the reference product. And then we have the non-clinical data requirements, which may um, actually not be necessary if there is sufficient similarity established at that um, structural and functional uh, level. And then Health Canada also subscribes to um, saying that if similarity has not been established, then a reduced non-clinical and clinical data package cannot be justified and the product cannot be considered a, a biosimilar. And then when we get to clinical data requirements, again, I, I said this uh, before, but the purpose is to show that there are no clinically meaningful differences between the biosimilar and the reference biologic drug. So the clinical evidence that we see is typically the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodyna pharmacodynamic studies, as well as, as likely at least one additional clinical trial. Uh, so then if, if there are differences observed between the biosimilar and reference biologic drugs, such as the uh, differences in immunogenicity, this needs to be addressed by the manufacturer. Um, and if the differences cannot be addressed, then the new, new drug submission route, uh, considering it a new biologic drug, would be more suitable. So this is really something that um, Health Canada takes a very tailored approach to. Um, at pre-submission meetings with the manufacturers, they would work with them to develop the most appropriate um, pathway or, or evidence base to, that would be appropriate for the uh, marketing authorization of the biosimilars. And then it's also important to note that for biosimilars, just as what is required for any other biologic drug, uh, a risk management plan needs to be in place. Um, so these are activities that are similar um, in, for a reference biologic drug and involve monitoring any known and potentially unknown safety concerns or signals um, that may result from, for example, the impurity profile or other characteristics of the biosimilar. Um, and then it also part of that is that continued assessment of any sort of signals that have come up, um, if that is applicable, and any clinical significance of that uh, immunogenicity. Because you may see some signals for immunogenicity, but it may not translate anything that is clinically meaningful. So uh, hopefully that gives you a good foundation of the regulatory requirements. And as I said, that really feeds into um, what you're going to see at CADIS um, HTA review level and then um, what you see uh, for the public reimbursement of, of these drugs. So now Lisa gave a good intro of, of who CADIS is, but for those of you who are less familiar with, with who CADIS is, um, we are a, a health technology assessment agency, and we inform uh, technology-related decision-making in healthcare. So as, as a means to do that, we offer a variety of products and services that are available um, publicly. And I've classified them here on the slide as two main uh, product groups. So the drug reimbursement recommend recommendations, which come from the Common Drug Review and the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review. So that'll be the focus of, of this presentation. And then you also see that we have another um, group of products in our health technology management program, which include the therapeutic reviews, optimal use, health 
technology assessments and, and other uh, products. So the Common Drug Review CDR and P-Coder, this is uh, more of a single technology assessment review that I'm going to be focusing on. Health Technology Management Program, the therapy, therapeutic reviews, for example, look at uh, multiple uh, drugs in one review, but we'll focus on the single technology assessment. So a bit of background on CDR. So this is a pan-Canadian process. Uh, and we provide formulary reimbursement recommendations to the publicly funded drug plans. And this is um, with the exception of Quebec. Quebec has uh, its own process called INES, which is similar to CADIS in that they provide uh, reimbursement recommendations in the province of Quebec. So there are 18 uh, participating drug plans. And so CDR was established in 2003 to reduce the duplication across jurisdictions. Um, to make use of um, limited resources and to enhance the consistency of the, the drug reviews and recommendations. And uh, also that, to note that our reimbursement recommendations are informed by CADIS, um, our internal teams, but the recommendation itself is, is done by an appointment national an appointed national uh, expert advisory committee called CDEC. So there's quite a bit of overlap with uh, PCODER, but PCODER also provides uh, reimbursement recommendations uh, to the federal, provincial, and territorial drug plans. Um, and th this is specifically for oncology indications. And again, um, it, it was formed to bring consistency uh, and clarity to the assessments of cancer drugs, uh, looking at the clinical cost effectiveness and uh, patient perspective, similarly to CDR. Uh, and again, uh, reimbursement recommendations are provided by uh, an independent committee called PERC. So uh, we have a drug that is, say, um, received market authorization from Health Canada. Now, if a manufacturer would like their drug to be considered for public reimbursement, that's where CADIS fits in. So most of the submissions that we receive, not all, um, do come from the manufacturer. So as I said, once Health Canada, the regulator, regulator establishes the efficacy and safety, then it comes to the HTA agency, if the manufacturer is interested, to assess value. And this is, um, uh, as I said, sorry, just something, uh, not sure. Just a temporary delay here. All right, there we go. So uh, HGA assessment of value happens at uh, CDR or uh, PCODER, or in Quebec, it's through NS. So CADIS and NS are the two national HTA bodies. And then once, once CADIS or NS has their uh, reimbursement recommendation out, it goes to PCPA, the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, which is essentially um, a group that in combination with the drug plans, they negotiate with the manufacturers. And then um, the decision is actually made by the uh, ministries of health and um, with oncology products, cancer agencies, following that negotiation through PCPA. So Health Canada establishes the efficacy and safety, goes through CADIS or NS, then it goes to PCPA and then to the drug plans for the ultimate um, formulary uh, decision. So just put another way, um, we also can see by this slide just the differences in the assessment that goes into each of these um, three, three buckets of, of groups and then the output that comes from that. So at Health Canada, Health Canada is focused on the efficacy uh, versus placebo, the safety and the quality in the manufacturing, and then they issue NOC or NOC with um, conditions. And then CADIS, on the other hand, we focus on the comparative effectiveness with several other inputs that I'll get into, 
but our output is then that recommendation. And then for uh, public payers, so this is the drug plans, they look at um, value, um, budget impact, and ultimately make the final funding decision. So this is a pathway that applies to all drugs, um, but all, just highlighting it so you have a sense of how biologics and biosimilars also go through this uh, funding reimbursement pathway. So I won't get into too much detail on this slide, but this is to give you a bit of a sense of what goes into the reviews that we do at CADIS. So on the left-hand side, we have the Common Drug Review, and on the right-hand side, the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review. Uh, so um, submission received from the manufacturer. Uh, there are variations between our two programs in the input that is provided, um, but both, both programs receive input from patient groups. Uh, PCODER also has uh, current pilots ongoing with registered clinicians to provide input, as well as receiving input from uh, the patient, uh, uh, the advisory group, so um, that coming from the drug plans. And then, uh, so once we have the input, the submission from the manufacturer, then we have our review teams review the clinical and cost um, effectiveness of the, of the drug, as well as um, considering the input from patient groups. Then this feeds into the discussion at CDEC or PERC. An initial or an embargoed recommendation is issued. Feedback can be received from um, the drug plans, in PCODER's case, registered clinicians and the manufacturer. And then following that, um, if, all, if all is okay, then it converts to a final recommendation. There are some subtleties and differences in there that I won't go into too much detail about, but that's just to give you a sense of the overall CADIS review process. So then I, I mentioned that the recommendation that comes out from our committees, um, this is a recommendation that goes to drug plans. So this is just a snapshot, a sample recommendation related to uh, one biosimilar that has come through the CDR process. And so you'll see that um, it has the recommendation uh, being to reimburse and, and a clinical criteria being for use in patients for whom a, ten, a tenor septic is considered to be the most appropriate treatment option. And then conditions being to reimburse in a similar manner to the reference product Enbro. And then the cost um, to provide significant savings to the jurisdictions compared to the cost of that reference drug. So this is an example of one biosimilar, but it has actually been fairly consistent. I think on the next slide, I'll, I'll get into the drugs that, or the bio, biosimilars that we've reviewed so far, but uh, generally the, there's been a lot of consistency between the recommendations uh, amongst the biosimilars. And also just to note that um, the only experience CADIS has with reviewing the biosimilars is through the non-oncology indications. So we've, re we've received um, no request to review uh, biosimilars in the oncology, so through the PCODER program yet. So as I mentioned, um, this is a slide looking at the biosimilars that CDR has reviewed. Um, so as you can see, since 2009, so 2009 predated um, the current review process for biosimilars. That's why it's kind of off to the side. Um, but you'll see that we've reviewed two, four, six, seven. Um, uh, in Fletcher, you'll see a note there that um, this is a, a biosimilar that came in uh, for the rheumatological conditions first, and then because Health Canada required additional evidence for the inflammatory bowel disease conditions, uh, it did come through at a later stage um, through CADIS again for reviewing the IBD indication. And then as you can see, as I alluded to previously, that currently under re review, we have um, a second infliximab biosimilar. 
So now I'm going to switch gears a bit. Um, so that uh, the previous slides gave you uh, a snapshot of the regulatory requirements and then how it works in coming through CADIS and then the reimbursement recommendations that go to uh, the drug plan. So now uh, on the slide, we've highlighted some questions that may come up from patients that are useful to help illustrate some additional concepts. So things like, how can they just switch me? Uh, have studies been done with this drug in patients with my condition? Um, what are other patients saying? Are biosimilars just all about cost savings? Um, and is Canada unique? So just considering some questions and then throughout, uh, I'll just touch on uh, some of the key concepts that, that are associated with some of these questions. So how can they just switch me? So this question, and you know, it's, it's come up a lot, this question of switching. And a lot of the concern I think is coming from even just uh, uh, a, a lack of understanding or just a familiarity with the different types of terminology that are used um, in terms of of um, using different drugs for different patients. Um, so I'll just, I've highlighted here on this slide um, three terms that may come up. So that is interchangeability, switching, and substitution. So no uh, biosimilar yet, uh, I don't know if that'll change in the future, has been considered interchangeable. So interchangeability, is a drug plan decision. And that is that occurs when products are so alike that the drug is expected to have the same clinical results as the reference drug in a given patient. So, so again, this is a decision made by the drug plans um, and no biosimilar has fallen into this category. Um, the FDA has actually produced some guidance uh, for manufacturers around how a biosimilar could meet the definition of being interchangeable. But as far as we're aware, there have been no biosimilars that have even gone through the FDA process for being considered interchangeable. Um, and Health Canada hasn't alluded to um, um, having any guidance around that uh, in the future as well. So that's interchangeability. Substitution, and actually interchangeability is often also referred to as automatic substitution. So substitution is another concept that, that essentially is related to interchangeability but comes at the dispensing level. And um, so it's, it's essentially the act of dispensing another product in place of, of another. So this could be automatic substitution and that's when they're deemed inter interchangeable or therapeutic substitute, substitution. But this, this would be either the physician's decision or based on the directive from, um, say, a hospital um, therapeutics committee or the drug plan. Whereas switching, um, switching is where I think the, the biosimilar or um, relation to the biosimilar comes into play because um, this is, the, and, and you know, there's no, I mean, different regulatory agencies, HDA agencies have different definitions of what it means to have a patient switch, but essentially it's a decision to change a specific patient's medication when they're already established on a reference biologic drug. So this is a decision that is generally made by patients with their practitioners and based on the available clinical evidence. So switching, um, this is coming up in evidence requirements um, because you do have patients who, uh, if a recommendation to reimburse is made for a biosimilar, you'd have patients who are both um, naive to uh, the, the biologic or who are currently on a reference biologic and could be considered switching to the biosimilar. Um, so, so those are just key definitions to keep in mind because as I said, interchangeability has not
been established for any biosimilars. So right now, no patients would ever be automatically switched to, to a biosimilar. And so just to give you an example, I pulled out the um, a, a, a note from the Nova Scotia Public Drug Plan Reimbursement, um, which related to a tenor theft um, for uh, Brenzis just recently came out uh, and has been negotiated through, or actually Arelzi has just been negotiated through um, PCPA, but the biosimilars for a tenor theft are now uh, available for, in public drug plans. So I've just highlighted this one here because it says, for a tenorcept naive patient who a tenorcept therapy is initiated after November 1st, 2017, the biosimilar will be the product that is approved for the, for the indications, and there were several indications listed. But this is really getting at that there is that distinction between a tenorcept naive patients and experienced. And saying that anyone who is um, on already on an existing attender step therapy, they'll continue on. They're not required to switch. So, second concept: um, Have studies been done with uh, this drug in patients with my condition? So, uh, and this is where the regulatory requirements are important to keep in mind because uh, a study, only one study, may have been required. Uh, so, and now you may have heard the term extrapolation um, of evidence from one indication to another, but that is, is difficult wording to use because although um, there aren't clinical studies included, if we remember that totality of the evidence approach to um, regulatory authorization, then we know that Health Canada considers all of that um, quality data uh, that is required as part of the, the uh, of the regulatory approval that goes into the decision to authorize all other indications, even if a clinical trial isn't available in that indication. So I won't read through this text, but it is just essentially saying that um, where similarity has been established, there may be indications that are authorized where clinical studies have not been conducted. And also just to note that these trials um, that are required at the clinical level for clinical outcomes are necessary to be completed in the most sensitive population. So that being the population that is likely to see any differences between the biosimilar and the reference product if it did exist. And so just an example, just to highlight that Health Canada is is being conscious of, of this fact that, you know, if a clinical study isn't available, um, then it may be important to have additional data to support other indications. Um, because they do require a detailed scientific rationale as to why, even if there's no clinical study available in a population, um, based on the mechanism of action, why it would be okay to, to um, assume that the uh, um, the efficacy and safety would be similar in other indications. So I had mentioned this on on our on a previous slide, but um, in in Fliximab biosimilar and Flectra that came through, it initially did not receive NOC for um, the indications of Crohn disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. But Health Canada deemed that it was important to have additional data to support the claim for the IBD indication. So they did postpone that NOC until that additional data was required. And so two years later, you see in June 2016 that it did receive NOC approval for those additional indications. So what are other patients saying? So as I mentioned, as part of the CDR and PCOTA review process, uh, we do uh, put out a call for patient input. So based on the CDR submissions that we have reviewed so far, um, we see that having access uh, to, to uh, drugs is important to patients. Cost is an important consideration. 
Patients want to see that these products are safe and efficacious, that the regulatory approval is rigorous, that there's ongoing surveillance, which we do see with the post-marketing surveillance requirements, um, that thoughtful consideration be given to the switching and substitution that I alluded to previously, that appropriate support um, programs are in place, similar to what exists for the reference drug. And we also see that there are a lot of uh, other patient group initiatives going on outside of our CDR review processes, um, including two from the, the Arthritis Consumer Experts and the Canadian Spondylitis Association. They've actually issued some educational material around what biosimilars are and, and considerations to keep in mind. And then to the question about cost savings. So are biosimilars all about cost savings? Now cost is an important consideration and, and um, Health Canada does not assess the cost and afford, or affordability. So CADIS does look at um, cost of drugs uh, compared to the reference products. So we see in some of the CDR reviews based on the Ontario's um, transparent price, we do see that there are cost savings associated with biosimilars. Now, if you compare this to generics, it's, it's not, I don't think, to the same extent as generics, but it does offer cost savings, which are, are important because our, our drug plans, they have limited budgets. Um, it's also help, helpful for um, patients uh, for greater access and, and affordability. And then when we just look at the opportunity costs associated with funding one drug versus the other. If we can get cost savings in some areas, then they can be just put towards other uh, drugs or other um, health health technologies. So not all about cost savings. We want to make sure that patients are receiving safe and, and effective um, drugs, but cost savings are a very important consideration for um, for moving biosimilars into the into um, reimbursement. So is Canada unique? So I've highlighted some um, some some countries here, uh, and I've just focused on a couple um, to highlight both regulatory and HTA agencies across the world. World. So Health Canada, from a regulatory perspective, um, they have ongoing collaboration with um, other regulatory agencies. So work closely with the FDA and EMA. Um, uh, for HTA assessments, uh, we at CADIS we have looked at other um, other HTA agencies' review processes, and I've just highlighted uh, some of some of their processes on the slide. But basically, the message is just to to share that um, CADIS isn't unique in any sort of way in terms of reviewing uh, biosimilars. Uh, you know, we're not going to talk to, to it too much in this presentation, but we are looking at uh, changing or revising our review process to make it more streamlined to have these uh, biosimilars reviewed uh, quicker, uh, which is in line with some of the approaches that are taken by, by other agencies. Uh, for example, even in the UK, uh, biosimilars are not reviewed um, on an individual basis, but they're reviewed as part of a, a greater multiple technology assessment. And then I won't go through Scotland, Australia, and Germany, but they do take, um, you know, more streamlined approaches to reviewing biosimilars. So that was uh, rather quick, but it, hopefully it gets you um, it gives you an idea of what questions that uh, your patients may have for you in terms of the concepts of um, switching, of authorizing indications, even if a, a clinical study isn't available, um, just some considerations about costs, what other patients are, are asking about, and just what internationally what we're seeing in the regulatory and HTA space. So what's to come and what's been going on in, the, in this space? So from a regulatory perspective, a lot of the information that I, I've shared in this presentation actually comes from the updated guidance document that Health Canada uh, put together actually probably a year ago now uh, related to biosimilar submissions. 
Health Canada has also actually just recently developed a biosimilar specific product monograph template for manufacturers. Um, so this is just highlighting some, some of those differences between the types of evidence that you would see and considerations um, for the public uh, related to biosimilars and how they're different compared to uh, regular drugs. And then as well, naming and labeling conventions. So right now, um, for, for biosimilars, both the, um, both the non-proprietary name as well as the brand name are listed on any sort of um, documents for biosimilars. Uh, but Health Canada is looking into the best way for handling naming conventions for biosimilars. For example, the WHO has put out a proposal for naming. There's no international consensus at this point, but they've proposed, for example, a biological qualifier. So that's a, a four-letter code um, attached to the non-proprietary name. So, for example, infliximab dash A, C, B, uh, B, something, for example, that would be devoid of meaning, but to essentially um, show that it's a biosimilar to a, a reference product. Um, but again, nothing's been formally set, and Health Canada continues to uh, work with other agencies in this. And I and I think I'm not sure where this is at, but they did plan to consult stakeholders in the most appropriate naming um, for biosimilars in the health technology space. So at CADIS, um, as Lisa mentioned at the start, we are currently um, in the process of revising our biosimilar review process. So in the summer, we put out a call for uh, stakeholder feedback on our proposed revisions to the process. So we're currently um, reviewing that and setting, uh, setting up the appropriate process to move forward. And then um, in terms of reimbursement when it comes to public drug plans and, and cancer agencies, I think we'll see um, uh, more biosimilars coming through for sure uh, and biosimilars for cancer indications will start um, likely in the new year and I think we'll also see an evolution of of this concept of switching and the evidence associated with that right now there have been studies that have come out related to switching they've been a, a variable quality from uh, <laughs> simply having patients in an open label extension phase, having switched to the biosimilar, or studies that have that extension phase but have multiple switches following the uh, blinded phase. So I think we'll see a lot of evolution in that space. And then uh, just over time with uh, patient and prescriber experience, I think that'll, that'll provide a lot of evidence to the use of biosimilars um, in, in public reimbursement. So with that, I uh, thank you very much, and, and um, I open it up to any questions. I imagine maybe some of you have submitted questions. Um, if not, feel free to do so. And again, you can send questions to events at tadis.ca. And there are a couple of questions here. Um, it's Lisa. So one question that came in early on was, how do how how do the the stakeholder feedback that you did actually mention? How does that impact the system? Yeah. So, well, I mean, as I as I said, so we did have that call for stakeholder input, um, and we did receive quite a few um, responses for that call. And um, if, if any of you did see the consultation documents, um, I think our, our main push for doing this was to streamline them. So to have our HTA assessments done quicker uh, so that these biosimilars can offer the, uh, the cost savings that they could offer quicker for drug plans. Um, yeah, so I think uh, allowing for that more immediate impact and closer to a potential uh, NOC from Health Canada. Uh, Helen, did you add anything to that? For sure. I, I think what you said, Marina, is 
spot on, but I think the other key piece around uh, having patient input into our process is really to understand some of the, uh, the potential challenges or benefits that patients may have, right? So it's really to help inform the decision makers on some of the implementation issues. So for example, if there may be, let's say, some uh, patient support programs that may be available with the biosimilars. So some of that will help to inform some of that decision. Great, thanks, Ellen. Okay, thanks. It's Lisa again. I have um, another question that just came in here. Um, it's kind of a two-part question. Some jurisdictions in Europe have begun controlled switches from the reference biological to the SEBs. What is the hesitation in Canada? There is clearly faith in the evidence slash safety of these biologics as naive patients are being mandated to begin with the, with the biologics. Well, I'm sure this is very politically, financially charged. Do you see this happening in Canada anytime soon? Yeah, that's that's a very good question, important question. I think um, Europe has the advantage of uh, of of having patents that expire earlier um, than in Canada, so they have been the leaders in the use of biosimilars, um, even at the regulatory agency level. There, they're really um, they have quite a bit of experience. So my first thought is just that they, that that the experience of using the biosimilars has been more prominent there than in Canada. Um, again, uh, the, the controlled switches, so switches, again, that would be up to the jurisdictions to, to put in place. Um, I mean, from a CADIS standpoint, we, in our recommendations, have, <laughs> in some cases, had an of note, which is not part of the main recommendation or any sort of condition or criteria associated with the recommendation, but have suggested that there's been no um, adverse effects or concerns for efficacy if a patient is switched from the reference product to the biosimilar, and that that should be done in consultation between the patient and the provider. So I think there's opportunities there. We haven't seen any evidence for potential um, any sort of harm or efficacy concerns. So, uh, like, I mean, I could just say that I think it's just a matter of time and experience before um, that would potentially follow suit similar to Europe. Okay. Um, and there's a second question there. Is there any functional difference in subsequent entry non-biologicals, i.e. the glutaramir acetate? Yeah, so um, glutaramir acetate is a bit different because, yeah, it is an, it's a non-biologic, but it's a, it's a complex molecule. Um, so I believe that product also went through new drug submission through uh, Health Canada, um, but, I, I think it's hard to compare just because, you know, with biosimilars, we're talking about um, biologics, whereas glutaramir acetate is a, is a non-biological. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I think it's difficult to uh, compare the two. Okay, thanks. There's another question um, around cost. Does cost include things like rebates and patient support programs? So, uh, I mean, in, on the slide that I had related to uh, the, the cost uh, comparison, that that would be, I think, just based on the cost of the product itself, um, whereas the rebates and anything extra would be built into, uh, uh, and patient support programs would be built into, I believe, the, the value negotiations through PCPA. Uh, but the, the cost, the price reductions that I mentioned on the slide would be just like cost relative to the reference product. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, 
is the review information um, that you spoke about, is it available to hospitals for their P&T committees? How do they go about accessing that? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so um, for any any drug, in fact, that we review, um, we have more immediately the reimbursement recommendation is made publicly available on the cadix.ca website. Um, so that, I mean, it depends when exactly that is posted, but, um, you know, depending on what happens in the, in the embargo period, um, but that would be available. And then uh, for, there was a bit of a backlog in terms of posting our clinical uh, and economic report. Um, for biosimilars, we do have a combined clinical and economic report. So for some of the biosimilars that have already been reviewed, that, yes, would be available online, similar to the reimbursement recommendation on the CADIS website. Okay, thanks for that. And I think that's all the questions that we had come in so far. If there's other questions, you can still email them later to events at cadis.ca, and we could uh, reply to them. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thanks um, so much, Marina, and for uh, he Helen for being online there to answer some questions. And I also wanted just to say thank you to uh, Pam McLean Vasey here in Nova Scotia. She's a CSHP um, education rep locally. And um, thanks to her for um, putting this, helping to put this together and to uh, sharing it with CSHP, the national group, to advertise it to their members because there's lots of people here from across the country. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And um, hope to have uh, another session again before too long. So thank you, everybody.